Good evening. I want to welcome everyone to Cold Springs Church of Christ in Lancaster, Texas. It's good to see everyone out this evening. Uh, to those of you that are in person, I'm glad to have you here. Those of you watching online, glad to have you as well. We're going to have a uh, Bible study here in a moment. First, we're going to open up with a song, and then uh, Jason Nichols is going to lead us in uh, prayer. Hymn number 391, if you're using the songbook, 391. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, bringing on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from. thankful for the rain that you sent our way. You've answered a prayer, not only ours, but many others across the land. Blessing the just and the unjust. And we pray that through these blessings that those who are without can see that there is a God and be thankful and be humble and come unto you. Help us, dear Lord, as we prepare our minds to learn more about worship, to act in what you've guided us and directed us to do, that we can learn more how to worship you Spirit and in truth, with the understanding of to look to please you in our lives. We pray and ask these things in your most holy name. Amen. All righty. Well, good evening, everybody. Good to be back with you after my sabbatical. Appreciate uh, many people who stepped into my place and covered for me, Joe, Jason, Jamie last week. I told Jamie, you lit a fire in me, get a will written. So uh, after he finished his talk last week, uh, my wife came downstairs and she said, here. And I said, what's that? She said, that's my will. And I looked at her and said, you going anywhere? She said, <laughs> <laughs> she said, not yet, but you can never be too prepared. So actually, my wife is better prepared than I am. So anyway, that was good advice, Jamie. You shared with us last week, and I've listened, of course, to Joe and Jason, the other lessons. Appreciate you guys covering. 
Now, before we get started, I, I need to cover something. I was a doubting man, Joe, on Sunday when I, you know, kind of kidded you about being a prophet of rain. You know, I, I, I have to admit, I wasn't sure I was a man of faith at that point, you know, and I kidded Joe, and he kind of looked at me and said, you just watch, Mark, and lo and behold, everybody, what's happened the last two days, right? <laughs> Oh, on the 23rd, okay, Joe, there's a prediction by Joe on the 23rd. Put your money down on it. Anybody can read a weather map. <laughs> Anybody can read a weather map. It wasn't on, I didn't see, this was on the weather map. I don't know, maybe it was. It was it on the weather map, okay. Yeah, anyway, I, I'm going to give you some credit anyway, Joe. All right. Now, only one cares as long as the rain came, though, right, everybody? And then now, unusual, we got it two days in a row. So I, I think... Your, did y'all have rain over here today? Because yes. for the last three or four hours on our side of town, it's been raining cats and dogs. So I wasn't even sure we were going to make it. It was lightning and everything. So we actually came to church a little bit later tonight because the weather was so bad. And I've never seen this before, but part of the highway was underwater. You know, usually highways are sitting up, but we were traveling about 10 miles per hour for about five or six miles. And I, was, I didn't see any you know, tra uh, what do you call it, flash, uh, cops lights or record lights or anything. I kept figuring, why are we driving so slow? And then suddenly we came to a part of the highway, and it must have been probably three or four feet of water. So everybody had to slow down because of that. But anyway, I don't think that usually happens, but certainly today it did. Jamie, you got a rain story? It, 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 there wasn't rain then? At, at 5 o'clock, there wasn't any? Oh, okay, at your house. Okay, so Red Oak, you, that's because, see, Jamie, when that happens, that means you're not a man of faith, okay? <laughs> Joe, can't, Joe can't do anything about that, you know. Faith, faith cometh before raining. Isn't that what the Bible says? I think that's what it says. Faith cometh before raining, okay? <laughs> oh, you got to check his head. Okay, Joe. <laughs> I'll let you and Jamie handle that. <laughs> Anyway, uh, those of you online, thank you for being with us. It's been hot here in Texas, and we've been praying for rain for the last several weeks. So suddenly, two days in a row, we got some, and that's how excited. In fact, that's how boring Texas is when you get excited about rain falling. I, I guess that doesn't say much about excitement around here. But anyway, we're glad where it came. So a few weeks ago, uh, fortunately, I, I came down ill, and we kind of put a pause on our study on worship slash church, and perhaps a few... Details have slipped from your mind, and I want to go back over some of those to make sure we refresh ourselves. But starting tonight, I would like for us to cover more or less three questions each week. So I'm going to go ahead and put these on the board, and each week after we cover whatever part of the lesson we're going over, I would like us to use those questions as application, okay? The first thing is whenever we cover something... I want us to ask, what is God trying to accomplish? What is God trying to accomplish in the passage, story, or illustrations that we're using? Okay, so that's the first thing. What is God trying to accomplish? And, of course, that's in the context of worship slash church. Question number two will be, what does this, whatever we're studying, have to do with church? What does it have to do with church? And then number three may be the most important, and that is going to be to say, how does this affect you personally? Okay? How does it affect your worship? How does it affect your viewpoint of church? So we're going to talk about the effect that it will have on us personally. And again, some of these may vary depending on what your point of view is on this. So I hope you got your thinking caps on as we get into that, the latter part. But let's do a little review again. I'm going to ask questions. Let's see how well you remember. What, again, this is kind of starting from the beginning there in Genesis. What did we say is the first act of worship in the Bible? This kind of symbolizes worship. What is the first symbol of worship in the Bible? 
That's right, Greg. Very good. It's a sacrifice. All right, now here's a little tricky one. When is the first sacrifice in the Bible recorded? Colby? Excellent. There you go. In Genesis chapter 3, I believe it's verse 21. So if you don't mind, we're going to go ahead and open our Bibles. And there might be a few people online, or maybe even some of us are not as familiar with some of these. So hopefully you got your Bible with you. But instead of me just kind of spitting these out, so to speak, I'd like for us to see them visually. As you remember, chapters 1 and 2 is about the creation of the world. Chapter 3 is about the sin out of Adam and Eve. Eve eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, giving some to her husband. God comes down, and he punishes them. He gives them some punishments. And then we get to verse 21. And suddenly it says, And the Lord God made garments of skins for the man and for his wife and clothed them. Now notice it doesn't just, just say garments, so we can't think fig leaves. Right, it says garments of what? Skins. So it had to be animals. We're talking some type of leather or something along that line. So God gave them something very durable. So it doesn't say God sacrificed animals. I, I realize we have to put on our thinking caps a little bit, but can't we agree that God must have had to kill some animals in order to come up with the skins? He could have done it miraculously, I suppose. But I think there's a lesson there. So here again... Let's ask that. What lesson are Adam and Eve learning from what God had to do as a result of their sin? Something had to die. And if you were to go to Hebrews 9.22, you would see, and that principle stands all the way through the Old Testament into the New Testament, of course, with the crucifixion of Christ on the cross, but, but somebody finish this verse for me. And without... The shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. All right, so can you see how that would be a very vivid image for Adam and Eve? I don't know that God killed the animals in front of Adam and Eve. I don't know even that that was necessary. But can you imagine God presenting these animal skins to Adam and Eve? And it would be like, because keep in mind, they probably have never seen a death. They probably haven't up to this point. I don't think there's any death in the world up to this point, the way we view paradise at this time, right? Death doesn't come into the world until Adam and Eve sin, and the first death is actually some animals that give their lives because of the sin of Adam and Eve. So I, I know this is a loose definition of worship, I don't, and I'm maybe the, even in the realm of what happened, it's hard for us to accept. Mark, is that really worship because God you know, killed some animals just to clothe Adam and Eve. And I, I realize maybe it's not, but at least the element of sacrifice, right, starts here. Can't we agree on that? And that sacrifice is used all the way through the Bible for worship, is it not? Sacrifices are used, as we said, to demonstrate forgiveness of sins. All right, now what is the second act of worship that's recorded in the Bible? The second act of worship. Again, there's another sacrifice. Who offers it this time? In chapter 4, we have two brothers, right? Cain and Abel, all right? So uh, we don't know, again, this is the first recorded example of a human being killing something or, in Cain's case, offering something in the form of food to God. But we have to, again, assume that they must have learned that expectation, shall we say, from God. And I would imagine Adam and Eve, their parents, were already involved in some type of sacrifice to some degree. Otherwise, why would you mimic something that's never been done before? So more than likely, the first sacrifice by God is given. And then from that st standpoint on, the, even though it's not recorded, we can imagine... When we get to chapter 4 and Cain and Abel offering their sacrifices, there were probably some sacrifices intervening in between there in that, in that time period, even though they're not recorded. Now, why? Go ahead and open up to Genesis 4 and be looking there in the first part of the chapter and tell me why did 
Cain and Abel offered sacrifices. And go ahead and open to chapter 4 of Genesis. You're going to have to put your thinking cap on again. It doesn't say there, God said to Cain and Abel, offer a sacrifice for this reason. Well, let's read it together and put on our thinking caps. Verse 3 of Genesis 4. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. Verse 4. And Abel, for his part, brought of the firstlings of his flock their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. Hmm. Does it really say? Can, is there anything we can pull from this, at least some element of why or the reason or motivation for the sacrifice of Cain and Abel? What do you think they were trying to demonstrate to God? Let's start there. What were Cain and Abel trying to demonstrate through their sacrifice? Kobe? Good. Kobe said if you could... I'm sorry, one more time. Okay. Uh, Colby would like to suggest that isn't this an act of thanksgiving to God? So think, they're, they're only giving a part of what they have. Cain, because he's a tiller of the ground, he's a gardener, he's offering some kind of produce. And evidently Abel is like a shepherd or a cattleman, if, whatever you want to call it, and he offers some of the animals. So like you said, I think part of that could be, hey God, thank you for blessing me with these possessions. I think that's, a, that's okay to kind of assume that. Anyone else? What might be another reason that they are making an offering here? Jason? Okay, so as we stated before, Jason said, aren't they following an example more likely that's been passed on by their parents? So why do you think, then let's go back to that, why do you think Adam and Eve would have offered a sacrifice? If this was a custom slash act of worship passed on to their children, what is it that Cain and Mabel would have seen in the sacrifice being made by their parents? Now let's go back. The first time Adam and Eve saw a sacrifice, if you know, loosely sacrificed, is when God killed some animals to cover them because of what? because of their sin. Is it possible that as Adam and Eve continued that, however that played out, whether God told them from that point on to do that or whether they took that implication that that was supposed to start at some point, is it possible that Adam and Eve took the example of what God had done for them and at least part of that meaning lingered over any sacrifice that they offered? And what meaning would that have been? Okay, you kind of said it, Greg. But in essence, there's a price to be paid for the faults of people. There's a price to be paid. And Colby, not that your part isn't important too, I do think, and we do see there are lots of sacrifices of thanksgiving in the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, we talk about thanksgiving of praise, I mean sacrifices of praise. Right? We think of singing in the sense of offering our hearts to God. So that symbolism is all there. So perhaps we don't know exactly all that was being implied by the sacrifices at this time. So we, we're starting, though, at least from a standpoint of God offered a sacrifice. It happened because of the sins of Adam and Eve. Cain and Abel here are offering their sacrifice. They've been blessed. But maybe also there's the, the thought of, right, that the faults of us, this is also indicating or asking God for an appeal to that. Hey, before we move on, anyone, anyone would like to suggest or talk about something else there? Maine?
I see. Miami, you know, comes from a culture that's very structured. And perhaps you've heard me make this illustration before, but whenever, usually when someone gives you a gift in Japan, you give back something in proportion. For example, when Miami's brother got married, uh, the average person, uh, I know, funerals and weddings in Japan are extremely expensive, but they would offer several hundred dollars in an envelope when they went into the wedding. And after the wedding was over, if I remember correctly, Miami, uh, your brother and his wife sent them a magazine, and they could choose uh, proportionately, I think, about 20% of what they had brought from that magazine or something like that. 50%. Oh, my goodness. So they could 50%. So 50%. And she was talking about, in, in her parents' case, in a similar way, uh, one of their neighbors were using part of their land. Uh, for uh, some type of use. And every year they would offer a gift to Miami's parents in, in the sense of saying thank you uh, for allowing us to do that. So her, her, she's implying, right, that isn't this a way of saying, right, that God has done so much for us, right, he's blessed us in some way, or God has done such and such and so and so, and this is our way of expressing our thanks to him. Great. Right? Cain's sacrifice? Mm -hmm. Cain's sacrifice? Yeah. Okay. The, the quality, the quality of it? Right. But, you know, like I said, I have to jump forward to get that information. Right. Well, but let's be honest, it could have been implied before this. In case you can hear that online, Greg's saying, you know, later on we read that God requires an unblemished animal as a sacrifice, right? Or whatever it is you're offering, there cannot be a blemish on it. An animal can't have, for example, uh, a crippled leg, or there can't be some type of mutilation or something on the body of the animal. The animal is supposed to be basically whole and without any kinds of scars or markings on it. And we do read that later on. So Greg's point was, you know, when you look and compare, and if you were here in, in chapter 4, if you compare Cain and Abel's offerings, and we brought this out before, but let's just look at the terminology. We don't have anything before this that tells us what is required of a type of offering because, again, keep in mind that all through the Bible, we don't just have offerings of animals. We do have offerings of produce and bread, okay? So I know I've heard some, unfortunately, people who don't think carefully about what they're saying are saying the reason Cain's sacrifice wasn't appreciated or accepted by God is because it was not an animal. And I'm not saying that that's not possible. It could have been God implied that at some point, but it doesn't seem to me, at least here, since we find out later on there are other examples of produce offerings, here it seems to be the point of the quality, right? So let's take a look at the terminology since Greg brought that out for us here, right? Look in verse 3. It just simply says, and this is reading from the NRSV, and some of you that got different translations, let's hear from you. Mine says simply, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. Does anybody else have any other terminology that might help us? Understand what type of quality? Okay, so there it just simply says, though, an offering. It just sounds like, you know, an average one, right? But when look at the comparison to verse 4. And Abel, for his part, brought the, in my, my translation, the firstlings, which usually means the best part. Somebody else got a different word? What is it, Gabriel? Firstborn of the flock, which... 
and the fat portions. There we go. And that fat portions usually when you say has nothing to do with the fact that it's heavy or <laughs> slim. The, the word fat in the Bible often means of high quality, right? Because there many times if something is healthy, it's not skinny. That's all that that meant. So there you go. So even though Cain's offering is not, it doesn't say that, that Cain gave a bad offering. When you compare it to what it says about Abel's offering, there does seem to be a difference in the quality because God or scripture here calls out Abel's offering as being from the fat portion or from the firstling or the best part. But then when it says Cain, it just simply says Cain bought an offering. So even if there was nothing materially wrong with Cain's offering, it paled in comparison to what Abel brought. And it seems to me the implication is Cain could have chose something better. It, that's what it seems to imply. Gabriel? Verse 7 says, you dwell, you do not yet. Yeah, good point there. Gabriel would like to point out verse 7. When you look down a little further, God says to him when, you know, Cain's getting angry about what his brother did, he, he, God says to him almost like a warning, if you do well, will you not be accepted? Well, the implication is that he must not have done well. He must not have done the best of what he could do, which is why he's jealous of his brother and why God is having to critique him and why God looked down on his offering. Great. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, that, your point's well taken. Greg said, you know, that there could be a little friction here in understanding if it had said that Cain brought the first part or the best of his, and it doesn't seem that. So, uh, Jamie, you have something to add? Oh, so not just well, but you do the right thing. Okay, that's even a higher quality. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I don't either, but I, I think I think your point is well taken. That in verse seven we could say, "If you do what is right." So you know, when you think of well, you might think of uh, kind of like a little bit better. But maybe when you use the word right, doesn't that kind of give it a little bit more of a stricter sound for the fact that? He really crossed the line. It wasn't just like, oh, you were a little bit lazy, but it was like you knew better, and you chose evidently not to do so. That's right. Yeah, it says, uh, right? It says, if you do not do well, also, look what that leads to at the end of verse 7, everybody. Sin is lurking at the door. Wow. One little slip-up like that can have great. You know, there's a whole sermon there in that, isn't it? But. We'll move on a little bit. All right? Now, <clears throat> let's move into the next time we really see sacrifices being offered. Who can remember the third one now? So we've got God offering it in Genesis 3, Cain and Abel here in chapter 4. Think, what comes after Cain and Abel? Into the what? What happens in starting in about chapter 6 and 7, 8 and 9? The flood. All right, so let's think through, okay? We have the flood takes place, all right? Noah comes off the ark, and what does Noah do? What, what was that? He, oh, he got drunk. Thank you, Jamie. That's exactly what I was looking for. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll leave that alone for another occasion when we talk about strong drink. <laughs> was that... Uh, that's right. Thank you, Ann. I'm glad someone here is taking me seriously. I do appreciate you, Ann. <laughs> okay, seriously, everybody. Let's, let's go over and look at that, okay? It's, I believe it's in chapter 9 here. Over in chapter 9. Yes. Oh, sure. Jump in, Jason. Mm-hmm. Say that one more time. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. Uh, by the way, everybody, I'm sorry. Go back one chapter to chapter 8. 
I want to, and we'll talk about what Jason just said. Verse 20, everybody, 820. Uh, let me read that, then we're going to hear from you again, Jason. So it says there in verse 20, and remember, he just came off the boat, right? And before he got drunk, thankfully, <laughs> um, this is another occasion that's kind of sticky in Scripture. We can perhaps deal with that some other time. But uh, right when he came off the boat, verse 20, right? Then, then Noah built an altar to the Lord right, and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Now, Jason, what was your point about this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Jason's saying, and I'm going to probably fill in a few things here, Jason, you can help me along here if you want, but isn't it interesting that the first thing Noah did when he came off the boat was he built an offer, an offer, an offering. Where did he get that idea from? Well, like Jason said, you go back to chapter 7, and as far as the unclean animals, they come in two by two, but as far as the clean animals, there are seven pairs of every animal. Now, why would you have so many more clean animals come on board than unclean animals? Is it just because they're clean and unclean, right? Some are dirty and un you know, not dirty. You, know, you understand, right, the word clean and unclean doesn't mean that they're physically dirty necessarily, right? Okay, now pigs are dirty naturally, and they're considered an unclean animal. But generally speaking, the animals that are divided up are divided up by all kinds of things like some of the you know, fish in the sea, because they have scales, they're considered clean or unclean. And some, because they crawl on their belly, are considered clean or unclean. It's birds, because they eat certain things or don't eat certain things, like, you know, scavengers are considered clean or unclean. But isn't it interesting that there were seven? Greg? I'm thinking clean and unclean. I'm thinking clean or edible uh, animals where the unclean are, like, uh, for example, skunks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> At least stinks, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, or, or even the rabbit, maybe. Uh -huh. Right. Then you have the, uh, uh, the deer would be dead. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, again, some of the animals are divided up, as you're implying here, Greg, like by hoofs, whether they also regurgitate their food or not. Some of them eat, and then they take it back down, and they eat it again, and, and so, uh, not to get too gross with you, but those are, I, I don't understand all the qualifications. I guess there's some logic to it, but generally speaking, God just divides the animals up into clean and unclean, but when you get to chapter 8, everybody, go back over there and look again in verse 20. What kind of animals did he offer on the altar? Hmm. What if he had offered two of the unclean animals of that one species when he got off the ark. They would have been extinct. So number one, we're just using a little logic here, right? God knew there, was, there were going to be, this is not going to be the only sacrifice, okay? We're reading the one sacrifice. Keep in mind, just like with Cain and Abel, I'm sure there were sacrifices before them. We just don't have them all recorded. And even though this is the only sacrifice we have recorded of Noah, I have no doubt, like you're implying, Jason, that somehow he knew that was an expectation that God had for him. And therefore, that must have been one reason why that was one of the first things he did when he got off. But as soon as he offers two of this particular species, now there's only six pairs of each of those, right? At least of that one particular type of clean animal. So it makes sense, logically, number one, that God would have more clean animals taken on the ark because before they have an opportunity to you know, multiply on the earth, there are probably going to be several sacrifices made. So to keep them from becoming extinct, God had a plan already in place for that. And so I think, you're, I think you're, one of your points, Jason, is God was already anticipating and that expectation by Noah, and that's why there would have been seven pairs to some degree. And, and again, there can be some numerology going on here. We, we talked about this in the past, but typically the number seven in the Bible stands for what, everybody? Completion, Completion right? So there could be some implied messages there. I agree. I don't want to, I don't, the Bible doesn't say that. I want to be careful of taking it too far. But I think even using just plain logic tells us, hey, it makes sense. 
you're going to use more of these animals, so let's take more on the ark, you know, before they have a chance to multiply. All right. We're going to stop here now for tonight and go over these three questions. And this is where I need you to put on your thinking caps, okay? What was, and we may have covered some of these all right. It could be a little review. That's okay, too. So let's start off with when what we've read tonight. Remember, written, the Bible is written by the inspiration of God, and he has various people that obviously are involved in demonstrating God's expectations for his people. But let's ask the first question. What is God trying to accomplish in these acts of worship? What is God trying to accomplish for worship slash church in what we read today? Haley? Hey, great, great, great. That's a good point. Uh, Haley would like to, to mention that one of the things we learned today, there seems to be a pattern. There's an expectation, right? How did, Adam, how did Cain and Abel know exactly what was expected of them? It, would it have been fair for God to hold Cain to a standard that he had not to some degree either spoke about or his parents illustrated? No, that would have been unfair. So there was a pattern even set for Cain and Abel, more than likely, you know, by God for their parents and then by their parents for Cain and Abel. And then as we get to Noah, right, he obviously knew the expectation because that's the first thing he did when he got off the ark. Yeah, I think that word can go hand in hand. Let's go ahead and put that one down, too. Great. Anyone else? Uh, what else do you think God was trying to accomplish in the three things that we studied tonight? Respect. Respect. That's interesting. That wasn't one I was thinking of. How can, how, where do you get respect from, Greg? You get respect from the fact that uh, uh, how uh, Abel's uh, sacrifice was accepted and Cain's I see. So there, there is a... You have a choice in the type of offering that you offer, and that can receive respect or disrespect from God. And, and also, doesn't that reflect how you feel about God, whether you respect him to the degree or not, or disrespect him enough that you're too casual? Great. Good. All right, this. Any, anyone else here on this part? All right, let's move into number two. Again, this is going to have to kind of broaden it a little bit because we don't really have church you know, in the Old Testament to the degree like we do in the New Testament. So we have to kind of think in generalities here. But what do these three stories have to do with church? Sacrifice. Okay. Anne like to say sacrifice. But Anne, I don't see any altar here in Cold Springs Church of Christ. Okay. Well, great. That's okay. I think we can use that parallel. In case you can't see me online, I'm, I'm touching our communion table here. It's off to my left. I guess if you're looking at it online, it's probably me, my right. However, anyway, it's over here to my to this side, right? And it does kind of look like an altar a little bit, doesn't it? The way it's it's made like that. And so, Greg, expand on me if we were to think of communion as a type of sacrifice. How would you connect this with that? Wow, very great. Boy, that, you could make a sermon out of that, Greg. <laughs> Let's see, you got body, death, and what was the other one? Blood. blood. There we go. The shedding, blood. the shedding of blood. Without the shedding of blood could be no forgiveness of sin. So in every sacrifice, right, there's something placed on the offering. That's a body. It is killed. It's not allowed to remain live. You know, you can't like, okay, we're done. Let's let the animal go, right? The animal is always killed. And then, or of course, there is usually the shedding of blood by the animal, uh, which demonstrates, right, the forgiveness of sin. So Greg's point would be right, that isn't the life of Christ, the body, right? His death, obviously, and he shed blood. So that is a New Testament image that is paralleled. Gabriel? Ah, great. And of course, we know that we worship God in the spirit now. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Gabriel's point, if you're online and couldn't hear that, is in the New Testament we have a thing called baptism, and it's a spiritual death that's entered into. Let's open up to Romans chapter 6, everybody, since Gabriel brought that good point up for us. Let's see that parallel made by Paul in Romans chapter 6. And we're going to start in verse 3. Romans chapter 6 and verse 3. Listen to the parallel between the death and the, and the baptism. Verse 3 of Romans 6. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death. So just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Excellent point, Gabriel. We all see that there, right? Baptism is a type of what, everybody, according to this? When you go into the waters, it's like going into what? Going into a grave. You're, going, you're, you're dying. And when we come up out of the water, it's as according to the last part of verse 4 there, it's coming into what? Newness of life, like a new resurrection, right? Great. All right, now let's move to number three. Now, again, I know we could, we'll probably cover and repeat some of these over the weeks, but uh, we'll stop there on those two on this. Now, let's make a personal application. And probably we don't do this often enough. We sometimes make, maybe make some good points and lessons and stuff, but oftentimes maybe we're not thinking, what does this do for me from this point on? Or what should it do for me? So let's ask the question. How should this information we've talked about tonight, these things we've just put on the board here, how should this affect your involvement with church slash worship? Great. The knowledge of what is expected of you. Okay. So now it, it helps to be aware, right, when you're here on Sunday morning, for example, why we do what we do. Don't you think it, it brings some oomph to it? Otherwise, it can be like going through mundane things, and you're like, I don't, you know, I don't want to get anything out of this. But when you realize that singing is a type of sacrifice, right? You're offering yourself to God. You're, you're offering sacrifices of praise to God. Then it takes on a little bit more of a serious tenor. And maybe the casualness that we might have taken to some of the singing uh, might be a little different. Let me give you an example. This past Sunday... Uh, and I'm still not able to sing very much because I start coughing whenever I talk too long, which didn't seem to affect the length of my sermon on Sunday. But uh, singing um, seems to do that even more so. So Sunday, for one of the few times in my life, I didn't sing one note. I just sat and listened to y'all. And it, it's, it's a little different. It, it's, uh, it, you know, before... I'm singing, and uh, sometimes I hear Bertha behind me because her voice is a little louder than mine. But, you know, uh, I'm half deaf anyway, so I don't hear very well. But on Sunday, I could hear er pretty much everybody's voice. And it, 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 was, a, it was different. I don't, I, and it was very, I don't know, I, I liked it a little bit. I was like, maybe I should once in a while just shut my mouth and listen to other people because there's something about hearing somebody else sing something and I'm not thinking about, let's be honest, we're all self-conscious. Whenever you sing, to some degree, you got, you're probably thinking, am I on the right note? Am I singing at the right speed? Is the song leader doing this? Or is this person behind me over here singing too loud? Or I wish this person would sing a different note? Or maybe they should be singing soprano when they're singing alto. And you can kind of all get caught up in that. Not always, but you can be, right? But on Sunday, that... That was not anything for my mind because I wasn't participating. I was just simply absorbing all of that. And maybe there's something to the effect that worship has on us sometimes is realizing, right, the tone that's being set in worship, how important it is for us to absorb what's happening to us. Someone else, what should tonight's lesson do for you? Haley? One more time. Oh, great. There you go. So uh, her point is, it's unacceptable not to give our best. And, of course, you're going back to the example of Cain and Abel, right, where we think, you know, and, and, and not that, you know, sometimes, and let's be honest, sometimes we can get 
too visually focused. And, and not that, for example, you shouldn't dress well on Sundays. That's not my point. Okay, but some people dress a little differently than others, and what's casual in one part of the country might not be casual in another part of the country, and the way people dress in Nigeria or Japan in church might be a little different than the way we dress here in America, right? I mean, that's obvious, but it should be attitude affected. Whatever it is you're wearing, whatever it is we're doing, there should be some thought and preparation into it, and I think that's Haley's point is Cain evidently was just like, hey, let's just grab some of these. This will do just fine. And if we come to worship in the sense of, well, and again, some weeks, you know, someone has passed away in your life. And it's hard to come to worship with that, you know, unnecessary optimistic attitude. That's understood. Or you had a tough health week. You've been to the doctor and something's happened or financial, right? And, and those things can affect your mood a little bit. But that doesn't necessarily affect the quality, even even being here is a sign that you're invested in what you're doing. But Haley's point is, on an average occasion, if we come and we just kind of sit through the motions and we're not thinking about the importance of what we're doing, isn't that some way in the same parallel to what Cain did? Because, I mean, some people would look at Cain and go, well, at least he offered something. <laughs> some people don't even offer anything. Uh, I think God still has a slightly different standard even than that, right? He even doesn't want, he, yes, he wants you to offer something, but he doesn't just want any offering. He wants the best of what you got. Gabriel? Uh-huh. In Jerusalem? Can't you get to hear that line? Gabriel's reminding us about the Samaritan woman in the well. You remember there in, in John there? The, and when the woman and Jesus carry on conversation, one of the woman's point, because she's not a Jew, right? She's outside the people of God. She's a Samaritan, unaccepted, living in various relationships with different men. And one of the points she makes to Jesus is, hey, don't you guys say that, you know, you're supposed to worship at such and such a place in such and such a way, and it's supposed to be structured like in Jerusalem and this way. And then Gabriel's point is, and that when Jesus said, there's coming a day when worship will not have to be primarily centered on Jerusalem or the city of Zion. In other words, Zion will be a word that indicates something more general, not a specific place. And there's a transition going on in worship that's taking place. So what we be careful of, and I'm glad you brought this out, Gabriel, you have to be careful of putting too much emphasis on what we're reading in the Old Testament. Yes, we should get something from it, but we don't have a physical altar that we're offering animals any longer. But we can take a parallel, but let's be careful of taking that to a degree that God did not intend, because there is a transition into a New Testament type of worship. And if we're not careful, we can refer like the Pharisees did to a more rigid lifestyle of worship. And we can fall into a very technical, legalistic type of mentality about worship and lose the essence of what God wants for us, which I think he's trying to relay to us in the New Testament. Greg? Um, I'm sorry, Joanne had her hand up earlier. Yeah. Good point. And, and that's, that might be the best some people can do, right, because of their physical condition. Good point, Joanne. Joanne would like to say, for some of us, just getting here can be a sacrifice. We have some people in really bad health. 
people like me on Sunday maybe couldn't sing because of one reason or another. So why come to church? Nobody can hear your voice. Well, besides the fact that nobody wants to hear my voice, maybe. But, you know, uh, why, why do I show up? Because I can't sing. Now, you know, I'm the preacher and I was going to preach. But my, my point is, is that if you're, you know, a member sitting in church and you're thinking, I can't do this, 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 and this. So why go? Then, yeah, it might be like, what's the use of showing up? But the, if your best is to be here and be present, I still think, much like myself on Sunday, you can absorb so much from it. And I, you know, really enjoyed that. In other words, passively sitting there and allowing you guys to kind of baptize me with songs and scripture and prayers and, and, and being in a slightly different mindset than I usually am. Jamie? No, it didn't mean that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I see. You're, you're thinking that when Jesus was speaking to the Samaritan woman, he was mostly talking about the ritual of sacrifices? Yeah, possibly. Yeah. Yeah, and, and let's hold on to that because we're going we're gonna to want to make that parallel when we get to the New Testament and we really get into synagogues and stuff and we're going to compare, yeah, worship in general. Yeah, and there's, yeah, there's worship certainly going on in the synagogue at that time. Greg? Okay, you have uh, the word text and mm -hmm. question mark. Yeah. I'm saying it's satisfaction. For who? For who? Satisfaction for you or for God? Okay. How does that work? Well, if I'm satisfied, God, I'm satisfied. Okay. <laughs> Good point. So Greg would like to say another, another effect that this should have is satisfaction. You should feel good. Is it okay to feel good when you leave church? Yes. I hope so, right? And hopefully you, it's like, it's like being in a game, right? Now, in, in a normal sports event, some of us don't get off the bench, let's be honest. But the spiritual life is not like that. We're all in the game all the time. So participation only comes down to one thing, and that's if you're willing, right, to participate because the opportunity, the place for you to participate is there. So the only reason participation doesn't take place is not because the coach doesn't put you in, because your place is already decided. Once you become a baptized child of God, you have a place on the field, right? And if you're not in the game, think of that loosely, that's not because there's not a place for you, the coach doesn't want you, it's because you have chosen to become passive in that. Greg? Uh, Oh, I see. Yeah. So people, the team members feel good, and so does every, so do the fans and the coach and everybody when things go according to plan, a certain play or a touchdown. Okay. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, we go, we're going to, again, each week you'll have an opportunity to participate here. May not have gotten everything in tonight, but thank you for your points there. I hope uh, we can each week make an application. We're now going to turn to some time of prayer. I hope you all got a prayer sheet. Um, there it is. About to say I didn't get his, but I did. Is that a new one? This is a new one, yes. This is from tonight. Sorry. Yes, Joanne. Okay, so Erling needs some prayers, everybody. Erling it's not feeling well. We'll certainly put Erling down here. Thank you, Joe. Joe would like to go ahead and mention that Bert is back in the hospital. That's where Narlin is tonight. I believe he's meeting with some doctors, as we know. Uh, Bert was here Sunday, and I got to hear her voice. By the way, she can't, you know, she, it's hard for her to sing very loud right now, right? But because I was quiet and I wasn't singing, I could even hear her voice even as low as it was then. So that was a blessing for me because we all know how well she sings. So, Bert, I don't know if you're listening online, but certainly... Uh, you brightened my day on Sunday with the effort you put forth into singing. 
All right, let's go over the rest of these and we'll see if you have any additions or subtractions or critiques there. We've got Della's eyesight, Leslie's recovery still, Shirley Banner's recovery as she continues to work on her physical condition. Uh, Nell continues to deal with that pinched nerve. I want to remember her. Anthony's cousin, Jennifer, who has cancer. Leroy continues to work on those knees and pancreas. I believe last week he spent some time at the VA. So, Barbara, wasn't that right? Were you with him when he called me last week from the VA? Because it came up with your name on the phone. I was like, oh, great, I get to talk to Barbara. And then I was like, Leroy, stop calling me. Give the phone to your wife. I didn't say that. But <laughs> anyway, uh, please let Leroy know we're praying for him. We've got Lee Lamar's uh, needed kidney transplant. Uh, she's still looking for a donor, by the way. If you know of anybody that has a kidney they'd like to donate, she would like to hear. Okay, Lee Lamar did? Okay, so Lee is also thanking everybody for praying for her. It's, it's good that she's able to get out. You know, she goes to dialysis three times a week, everybody. It lasts several hours. It's very draining, but she's still here with us on Sunday. And again, let's pray for her kidney transplant. Remember Pat Hussey, she continues to deal with her health issues. Jane Pickering with her eyes. Starla with her back. And she's doing better. She's right now. She's suffering from uh, getting her transplant from COVID-22. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so. COVID. And then, and then the next one is Tom Anderson. Uh-huh. And then side of back is almost healed. All right. Uh, everybody like to add Starla. Uh, she's still recovering from COVID as well as dealing with that back. But also, number 10, Tom Anderson. He's about over his spider bite, which Greg said has been going on for about a year. So it doesn't look like he has to go back to the doctor anymore. So let's take some credit for that, everybody. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, telling Greg we're glad to hear he's doing well. Let's remember many of our shut-ins. We've got Jewel, Audra, Janie, and Doris Brown. And then Doris Williams, uh, she asked us several weeks ago to pray that she continues to reach out to her family. She needs strength and wisdom as she helps them deal with matters, serious matters in their life. Just remember Shirley Banner, son-in-law. Uh, that's Kathy's husband who deals with anxiety as well as Kathy's eye. I don't have any update on Kathy's eye. Hope that's improving. Benny's sister, Maria. Hasn't been able to be with us for several months because she deals with that congestive heart problem. Bertha's niece, Regina, with her knee recovery. Of course, the people in Ukraine. Debbie Bennett, she continues to take care of Corey's baby. Bertha's brother, Daryl, who's dealing with that addiction. Uh, so remember, our outreach to young people. Uh, Joe and Marcy's granddaughter, who continues to serve in Kuwait. Uh, mine and Miami's children, just in general, if you would, for their faith. Our elders' leadership as they continue to grow into that. Ethel's health. Mark Bennett, James' brother-in-law who has cancer. Of course, we've got Linda Prince. As we all know, she needs our prayers for her spine problems, treatment, and just health in general. Marsha Howard's daughter-in-law, Tricia, who continues to have the treatment on her eye cancer. Shirley Banner's niece, Tammy, for that plate pacemaker she had put in. I want to pray for Thelma, Jewel's other daughter uh, that's still recovering. Kendra, Doris Williams' daughter, uh, she asked us several weeks ago to pray for her health and anxiety challenges. Let's keep up our one-year Bible reading plan. We're in Isaiah now. Uh, Barbara asked us a while back to pray as she deals with some challenges in the family. I want to continue to think of Evan as he gets into his first full semester. I believe you want to tell anybody about how Evan's doing uh, right quick. <laughs> okay. Oh, he ain't living on the street right now, is he? Okay, that's good. Okay. Oh, I didn't come back. And anytime you get to a place you know you're going to be for a long time, you get a little more relaxed. So right now he's in a friend's place, but he's moving somewhere else. Uh, Jason said he's actually learning how to really study. 
Uh, so let's continue to remember Evan. Hopefully we'll see him somewhere down the line, maybe Thanksgiving or before. Hopefully we'll, we'll see his growth there. Let's continue to pray for him. And by the way, we're, you guys have participated monetarily in helping him go to preaching school. So thank you for your part in that, as well as our missionary, uh, Damien, over in Jamaica. We've got Bertha's health, as we've mentioned. Let's remember Simone and Jordan. Uh, Simone is, of course, Gabriel's granddaughter, Gabriel and Tammy's granddaughter, and Jordan is Mark and Miami's niece, as we continue to pray that they'll be baptized. Let's remember Mary Leonard, Bertha's sister, who has pneumonia. Uh, Anne's niece, Anne, I don't have anything else on that. I'm sorry. Did, was there some, what, what was it about your niece we were praying for? Oh, that's this Anne, sorry. That's right, and, her, and the relationship with her mother. Okay, we'll keep praying for that. So Anne's niece, Anne Bradley's niece, everybody, that uh, we'll pray that, uh, that she'll come back to the church and the relationship with her mother. All right, let us continue to grow in faith. Uh, um, excuse me, let's continue to pray for the growth in faith of Diesel and Dominique two of our most recent uh, converts. Let's also remember God in all our decisions. Let's not let the negative news defeat us. And let's remember that as saints, we are more than conquerors. All right. Anybody like to add or subtract anything? What about Kathy? Okay. So we can take that off, I guess. About her eye, Kathy's eye. Oh, she. So she's got the walking boot on, but the eye is better. Kathy's husband. Who? Ah, uh, Shirley's. Shirley's niece's husband had back surgery. Okay. All right. I've got this. All right, let's pray together. I'll lump all these together, if you don't mind. Father, you've heard us just go into great detail about the needs of your people here, some relatives, friends, and family, people we're concerned about, new converts that need to grow in faith, people like Bertha that are dealing with serious health issues, she and Linda. And others, we have several shut-ins that are dealing, uh, you know, with that stage of life. And there are other situations among our church family here, some that deal with family members that we're concerned about, spiritually speaking and physically speaking. We do ask for your blessing and look in on each one. May you answer the needs of each one here tonight and of the ones we have on our list. In your son's name, we lift them up. Amen. All right, let's have some... Announcements, Jamie? Hutchins got singing Friday night, everybody, from 7? And we're hosting in September. We also have the fellowship meal that's coming Sunday. I'm sure Jamie and, and Janice would like you to sign your name up out there. Uh, we're, uh, you know, under the items that you will bring so they can know what they need to provide themselves. Any other announcements? All right. Well, if not, nothing else, I'll offer an invitation, and we'll have that in a closing prayer. Though, so, I don't know if you've been watching the Little League World Series. Anybody else have that kind of interest? I actually played in that when I was living in North Carolina. We were one game from going to it. And anyway, it's a long story. But, uh, I greatly enjoyed that. So I like to watch these guys. They're on you know, ESPN and everything. Did you see what happened yesterday, though? You saw it, didn't you, Ian? Man, it was just brought. It, did you cry too when you saw it? Very touching. Well, you didn't cry because you didn't play baseball. I cried because I played baseball. Anyway, let me just tell you real quickly. This is really touching. You know how they say a little child will lead them? So this young man stepped into the batter's box. The pitcher threw the ball and hit him in the head. The young man fell flat on the ground, looked like he was knocked out, you know, looked like he was really hurt. Finally got himself together. 
He got up and walked down to first base. While he's standing on first base, he's watching the, watching the pitcher on the mound, and the pitcher now is full of emotion because, you know, he wasn't trying to hit the young man. They're, you know, just playing the sport, and he, you could tell he started quivering, and he started getting emotional. You know what happened? The young man on first base took off his helmet, laid it on the ground, walked directly to the pitcher's mound, and hugged the young man that had just hit him in the head with a baseball. And he whispered in his ear, says, you got this. Keep throwing strikes. And I, you know, I, I just think there's, you know, a few of our pro athletes could use a little of that, don't you think? Maybe even in the church, some of us could learn some lessons from kids like that. Even on a competitive situation like that, that young man who had been the one who had been harmed actually was concerned about the one who harmed him. And I don't mean that in a, you know, uh, mean way, just in the sense that he was concerned for the, and that young man was, he felt really bad about what he did. Uh, today I was watching an interview of those two young men, they had them on TV today, and they interviewed the two young men, they were talking about how, what both of them thought and felt, it looks like these two young men are going to be friends for life now, so isn't that a neat thing how that brings you together, but a little forgiveness goes a long way in compassion for others. Tonight are you in need of forgiveness or compassion? If so, we're here to offer that and make that known now as we stand and sing. More about Jesus, what I know. More of his grace to others show. More of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. More, more about Jesus. More. together bow. Our Father, tonight we thank you for the class we are able to attend, and we thank you for the rain that you sent to cool this earth where we live. And we pray tonight as we depart from this place, we want to learn more about you. And not only learn it, Father, but to share with those that are without. And now may the grace of God and the sweet communion of his Holy Spirit rest and abide with us until we meet again. It is in Jesus' name we offer this prayer. Amen. See you Sunday, 9.30, everybody, Bible class. Worship, 10.30, afternoon, 10. Thank you. Bring somebody with you. Bring somebody with you. We've got some food for them.